Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is gonna be another one of the math skills videos. I said that I was gonna do a crash course series, but I'm actually gonna do it as just a series of like shorter math skills videos instead of like a crash course, because I don't want it to be kind of confused as being theory based. There's very little, if any at all, actual like maths theory, so to speak, that actually gets applied in, in section three. I know like we talk about logs and stuff like that, but I've already done a video on those. So I think it would actually be a little bit confusing to do it as a like a crash course series, like the other science sections and everything. So um, instead we wanna think of the maths component of section three as just being um, an application of some basic principles or some assumptions that you can make to help quickly navigate kind of mathematical reasoning and that kind of thing. So the videos that I'm gonna do, I've already done a few of them on dimensional analysis and some kind of bits and bobs on logs and exponentials and that kind of thing. Um, it's just going to be highlighting some of those really important kind of assumptions or key skills that you can use. They don't necessarily tie themselves to a specific question type. They're more so things that we see broadly just kind of pop up randomly. You can see it come up in a chemistry question, in a bio question, in a physics question, obviously. Um, but you can even see it in some of those like experimental design analysis and data analysis type uh, questions as well that we're getting now. So in this one, I wanted to go through estimation techniques. So I'm sure you're probably already aware of what estimating is and the basic concepts of how to estimate, but you probably also run into some trouble where you've uh, done the calculations, you've technically done the calculations correctly, but your, your actual final technical calculation of the answer was not quite accurate enough. And it's either led you to going 50-50 on two different answers that could be possibly it. You haven't gotten it close enough or a small enough margin of error or you've actually trusted your calculations, it's got too much of a margin of error, and it's led you onto the wrong answer as well. So those are some of the things that pretty commonly come up, at least that's a very common complaint that I see from students. And uh, so that's what we're gonna be dealing with, how to actually get around that. So first of all, um, we're just gonna look at a little bit more of what the actual problem is. So if we were, here we are, so if, for example, we had uh, something like 2.4 over 50, and for whatever reason, say the answers were relatively close together and we actually had to get that down to a decimal answer to determine the answer, right? So the first thing that people think is, oh, okay, we'll just call it three out of 50, for example, um, and just round it up, or maybe round it down two out of 50, and that will work, right? But if you're trying to compare two values that are two fractions, and you've got to then estimate their values and then compare them and that kind of thing. You've got to think about the relative amount of change that you're actually making to the number. So people might look at that and go, well, 0.4 down or 0.6 up to the next whole number, relatively small, and that's kind of true. But it also depends on what your actual value is. So if I was comparing that to 24.4 out of 50 instead, of course, I could put this one up by 0.6 and I could put this one up by 0.6. And in that result, then I would get uh, three over here out of 50 versus this one over here would go up to 25 out of 50. And so of course, then if we estimate those with 50ths, I'd probably go a 50th is 2% or 0.02, three lots of that is 0.06. And then over here, this is exactly half 0.5. So, of course, we're not trying to say the two numbers are the same, but if we look at that relative to the actual value, I'm just going to use a like calculated, like actual answer here. This one over here, 2.4 out of uh, 50 is 0.048. So if we look at the actual error margin that we have there, we have an error margin of 0.012. If we compare 24.4 out of 50 to our estimated 25 out of 50, this here would give 0.488 and so again our error margin is 0.012 so the absolute error margin is no different but what we've got to factor in is the relative error margin compared to the actual value that we're considering so we look at a relative error and i like to think of it as a percentage instead this is the thing that you actually want to be paying more attention to when you're making uh, estimations rather than the absolute value of the change that you're making so we can see here that Relatively speaking, this uh, is the numbers that we're talking about. This one over here is about 10 times larger. So in terms of, oh sorry, it's 10 times smaller. 10 times smaller. This one over here is 10 times larger. 
So what that means is this here is 10 times less significant than an error margin of 0.012 over here. This is 10 times more significant than the other. And so what that means is that we've got greater accuracy in this particular estimation and far less accuracy in this one, despite having made the exact same jump or the same leap, right? So it's all about relative proportions of the two. So instead, what I like to do is think about the relative proportional changes and think of them as percentages. And I usually have a rough margin of saying, I don't want to go anything more than about 10%. I always want to stay less than 10% up or down if I'm adjusting the numbers to make them like cleaner or easier. So if for example, I had 3.7 over uh, 45, for example, right? Well, then what I might want to do here is I might want to push this number up to say five out of 45, because that's way easier to estimate than 3.7 out of 45. If I'm to do that, I roughly work out in my head what is 10% of 3.7. And partly why I use 10% is one, it's a pretty clean kind of error margin maximum, but it's also a really easy way to work out what your limits are. So 10% of 3.7 is 0.37. So what that means is I cannot adjust up or down 3.7 by more than about 0.37, which in my head, I'm just gonna call 0.4. So if I push that up, for example, to four in that case, then I've pushed it up by 0 0.3, which is within my range, within my kind of allowable limits. So if I call that four out of 45, then I can work with that. That's clearly not gotten me a very good fraction though. If I pushed it up to a five out of 45, that means that I actually pushed up the numerator by 1.3 now, and that is much, much greater than 10%. Even though 1.3 is a relatively small number, it's relatively large compared to the number that I'm actually adjusting, right? It's about a third of the size of it. So that is much, much more than my 10th or 10% margin that I'm going for. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The next thing is, if you're making adjustments to fractions, you can make adjustments to the numerator and the denominator and aim to try and make roughly the same proportional change in the two. And that then brings me to the other concept of just general increases and decreases. If you've got A times B over say C, what I want is that the change that I make by proportion at the top should be roughly the same as the proportion at the bottom. So say I hold B constant. If I increase A and I decrease C, an increase in a numerator and a decrease in a denominator would be an increase in the overall fraction value. So that would be an overall overestimate. What I would want to keep things constant so that I'm still getting a rough measure is I would want either both to go up or I just rewrite it over here. The other option is I'd want both to go down and I want them to go up or down by the exact same percentage. So again, if I have a 10% increase up here, I want a 10% increase down here, then it cancels out. If I have say a 15% decrease here and a 15% decrease here, it doesn't matter because I'll end up getting the exact same answer. The proof of that would be in a really simple example of equivalent fractions. We all know that one quarter is 0.25, right? We also know that it is the same as 25 out of 100. But if you ask someone to decimalize the two, they might say that this is actually easier because they can see it as a percentage, for example, they can see it out of 100, right? This is obviously not teaching you how to actually do this. This is just proof of the percentage changes that I was talking about before. The reason for it is, if we were to multiply the numerator and the denominator both by 25, we end up with this result. And what we're really doing by doing that is we're timesing it by the fraction 25 over 25, like this, and then we're getting 25 over 100. And really 25 over 25 is just one. So we're really just restating the exact same value. And there's our proof, right? So when I talk about the percentages being the same, what that means is if we wanted say an 8% increase, that is the same as timesing by 1.08. If we had a 4% increase, like we had on the bottom, that's timesing by 1.04. So if I had say one quarter and I'm timesing by 1.08 on the top and 1.04 on the bottom, you'll notice that if I look at these two here, this is roughly one, right? I could do it as 108 over 104. That'd be the same thing as well, just timesing them both by 100. And you can see this here is approximately one. So therefore I've kept approximately one. If I had 
something where I had significant increases on the top. Say I had 32 out of 92. And I just went, oh, well, I can just add eight to both of those because eight's a pretty small number. So if I go plus eight here and plus eight here, then I'm pushing that to 40 and this to 100 and I can go, oh, perfect, that's 0.4, right? The problem with that is by proportion, what I've actually done is eight is a relatively large chunk of 32. In fact, it's a 25% increase. And on the bottom here, it's a relatively small increase. It's less than 10%. It's maybe about 8%, right? Because 10% of 92 would be around about nine. So um, what that means is I've taken 32 out of 92 and I've times it by 1.25 and 1.08 and this here is a lot bigger than one so what that means is that I've actually massively overestimated so 0.4 is actually quite a big overestimate like that now what I could do instead is I could make slight adjustments instead I could go with 32 out of 92 I could maybe subtract two I could reduce them both by two the reason why I can get away with that, normally I wouldn't do the exact same absolute change, is just because two is a relatively small fraction of both of these numbers, right? So here, this would go down to 30, this would go down to 90. Two out of 32 is, well, it's 1 16th of it, right? It's, which as a decimal, uh, as a percentage, I don't even know, right? 1 16th, what, 12, 8%, it's gonna be like maybe around about 4% or something like that, um, decrease. If I look at uh, two off of 92, that's a really, really small chunk. That's again, around about 2% decrease or so. So yes, the numerator is going down by more than the, the uh, denominator in relative terms. But again, one, uh, well, timesing by 0.96 and timesing by 0.98, this here when divided gives you around about one anyway. So this is gonna be a pretty good approximation of one third. And you'll notice that when we do it that way, and we're keeping track of our percentage changes, all of a sudden we can see that there's quite a large error margin there. And that could lead us to the wrong answer if we were to do the top one, just assuming that eight is a relatively small number relative to say 92, it's large relative to 32. So again, keeping within those kind of 10% bounds is a good way to kind of keep on track. If we were to do the 10% method, 32 over 92, right? 10% of this, so that would be a limit of 3.2, 10% of this, a limit of 9.2. So then I could push that, I might go, you know, down to 30, because I can go down by two, which is within this limit, plus or minus, plus or minus. And uh, because I went down on the top, it means I have to go down on the bottom, right? And so if I go down on this one, I might go down to about 85 or so, and the reason why I'm going down by seven is because seven as a proportion of 9.2 is, I'm gonna say around about the proportion of a decrease of two out of 3.2, right? Like that. So I'm trying to get roughly the same uh, percentage proportion decrease like this. And then I might simplify by dividing by fives and get, uh, what's that, six out of 17, uh, which again, then from there, I could keep making estimations if I wanted to but uh, I might go six out of 18, which is around about 0.33. So you can see, I can kind of get back on track using that 10% limit overall. So that's pretty much it. That's what you wanna be doing is thinking about the relative error margins in both the numbers or in all the numbers that you're changing and making sure that those relative proportional changes are all actually canceling out. That's the main thing. Um, yeah, some people have asked in comments and stuff like, how far can I go with it before it becomes wrong? It's kind of a subjective thing. It depends on the actual answers. Always check whenever you have to do these estimations, just check the relative scale of the four options. If they're all out by orders of magnitude, then you probably don't even have to go to this level of degree. But if you can see they're going down to decimals and they're you know 0.1 off or that kind of thing, and it's getting quite technical, this is where this starts to come in. You would never, at least from what I've seen, you would never need to actually be multiplying decimals to complete accuracy with no error margins because yes, they wanna see your math skills without a calculator, but they don't care if you can actually calculate decimals all that well. They wanna see if you can make basic assumptions to get around those problems because again, that's part of problem solving and kind of working through information and deciphering what's important versus what's less significant or uh, less relevant. 
So that's it. So hopefully this was all helpful and uh, I will see you guys in the next maths video. Thank you.